a disclosure slide. And then this is 2.2 days in the, in the life of a diabetes patient with the coronary syndrome. This is serious business, of course, so we know that this is a pri prime driver of mortality in diabetes patients, and we know that uh, it can be helped, but then we need to uh, avoid recurrences, we need to help the complications, and sometimes the cardiologists will be there to help us, and sometimes they won't because they run away to the next card lab uh, patient. Uh, so uh, what happens, and, and, and welcome to the patient uh, in the diabetology clinic. We know a lot of things, you've already heard these things. We need to lower blood pressure that will actually reduce the number of cardiovascular uh, events in our patients. We need to lower cholesterol because that will also reduce the number of cardiovascular events in our patients. I'm actually, and you may disagree, I'm actually a believer that uh, lowering blood glucose levels to a certain extent will also lower the risk of uh, cardiovascular events. So lots of stuff to do for you and me in the diabetology department. <clears throat> um, this is not only a cardiovascular thing. We, we know that the patients are at high risk of having myocardial infarction, be it STEMI or non-STEMI, but your patients also have a very high risk for stroke and your patients have a very high risk for other cardiovascular diseases. So you have a patient who is a, a sort of a vascular bomb, not necessarily just a cardio patient, but a stroke patient or a patient at risk of having stroke and a patient at risk of having peripheral artery disease. So you have a lot to do in the diabetes clinic, not just thinking about the heart, but uh, thinking about many other aspects in your post-coronary syndrome patients because they are at a very high risk for any of these any of these uh, complications. Uh, the risk will generally be a two-fold risk for any of these conditions. So what can we achieve by lowering blood glucose? You've already seen the pooled data from some of the large, albeit now very old studies, some of them at least, uh, for glucose lowering, the KPDS, the Accord, the Advance, and what is actually uh, very well known to us and very important to us is that we can lower the risk for microvascular events in patients by lowering their blood glucose. This is an important issue. We know that this is a symposium about cardiovascular disease, but we also know that it is, it is important to preserve renal function as long as possible and to avoid microvascular disease in the nerves and in the, in the eyes. So generally, no doubt that we can uh, or at least very little doubt that we can reduce microvascular complications by treating blood glucose levels. Far more doubt whether we can reduce cardiovascular disease, but as I told you, I'm a believer, and, and the red dots are the long-term follow-up, sorry, the red arrows are the long-term follow-ups of the UKPDS and the VADT study, showing that there is probably a long-term beneficial effect of lowering blood glucose uh, in patients uh, with, with uh, type 2 diabetes. So, on that note, uh, what can we do? Uh, what can you do? And this is a very uh, sli long slide with a lot of uh, things you can do to change the uh, setup of your diabetes clinic the uh, education of your patient, even the education of the, uh, of the doctors or nurses taking care of the patients. Uh, my main message is actually that if you do something to your uh, clinic, to your patients, to your doctors, to your nurses, they will, the patients will benefit from it. So whichever intervention, almost with no exceptions, uh, whichever intervention you do in your clinic, uh, to improve treatment uh, of your diabetes patients, they will actually benefit from it. So what we have to do is to go home to see if after this symposium and after this meeting of the ESD, am I up to date with my treatments? Was there an educational uh, lesson to learn from some of the uh, lectures that I attended? And then go home and implement the, uh, the interventions, because if you do that, you will actually also improve the outcome of your patients, at least concerning HbA1c. So one job for you in the diabetology department. 
Next job is, of course, to find out that if this, the, the, the field of expertise for you is to lower blood glucose, and how would you do that? You have a lot of drugs uh, in your hands, some countries more than others, but generally you have a lot of drugs. You have the glitosols, which will affect the fat tissue and, and, and the muscle uptake of glucose. You have the SGLT2 inhibitors, which will cause renal glucosuria. You have metformin, which will lower the glucose production of the liver and probably also improve muscle glucose uptake. You have incretin-based treatments that will lower glucagon and increase insulin. You have insulin. And you have the sulfonylureas, which we discussed previously. So you even have ACABOs in some countries, actually, which appears to have a very beneficial cardiovascular profile. So you have to go home and improve your clinic. But next, you have to go home and find out which drug should I treat my patients? Uh, which drug should I afford this patient? Which drug should I afford the next patient? Should it all be the same, because that, that is the easiest way and the cheapest way? Or should we differ uh, treatment between patients? Uh, and this is just to emphasize that the reason that we have so many drugs is, of course, that they are there and they've been developed, but also that we have very different patients. This is a, a table showing the uh, figure showing the insulin sensitivity on, on the vertical slope and on the horizontal slope, the beta cell function of uh, one. 1,000 newly diagnosed Danish type 2 diabetes patients. And they're not alike. They're not all the same. Uh, some are very insulin sensitive. Some have a very high beta cell uh, function, very high insulin production. And some have, are quite insulin resistant, of course, and have a quite low insulin production. But should these patients be treated with the same drug? Probably not. You could probably benefit uh, from one drug down here and another drug up here. So there is a reason that you have to go home and examine uh, your clinic, develop your clinic, but also develop uh, programs for your individual patients. This patient, I will suggest, is treated with this drug because he's probably down here. He's a slim, recently diagnosed type 2 uh, man of 50 years old, he might be down here. He should probably not be treated with the same drug as a very obese patient. We'll have to find out uh, whether that is true. There is no evidence to suggest that you should use one or the other drug. As you know, we all uh, suggest that metformin should be the primary drug and that we can add any other drug as a second line drug. We don't really know which is the most beneficial, but, uh, but definitely, definitely the patients will differ. So probably your treatment should differ as well. Well, this is a very important slide from, from now, not that recent guidelines from the ADA and the ESD. It's beautiful that, that, that these two large organizations can actually work together. And our chairman, of course, has been very implemental here. Uh, and it is very important to define the abilities of your patients and what you expect that this patient can actually cope with economically. Can he sense that this is a hypoglycemia? Can I treat him to a very low uh, HbA1c because I know he will know how to react on a hypoglycemic attack? Uh, and so there is a, quite a number of uh, considerations to do with your patients when you decide the level of treatment, the intensity of treatment, and the type of treatment that you choose for your patients. So there's a lot to do in the post-ACS patient for the diabetologist. And the post-ACS patient will probably be a very complicated patient, and you will have to take, uh, take good care of these patients because they are at a higher risk of many complications. So, individually uh, establish targets for the patient and consider the treatment very well before you initiate it. So, this is just to reintroduce you to the pharmacy, uh, to, sorry, to the pharmac pharmacology lessons of your, uh, of your university years. This, of course, this is a gentleman with a very, very long name, which is why he decided to call himself Paracelsus. And he's the one who taught us that all drugs are poisonous or can have side effects. 
actually not very many drugs have no side effects. It's a question of dose and it's a question of choosing the right drug. So we are obliged with our patients to do no harm and to consider very carefully which treatments should we use in the diabetes clinic for these patients. So, and, and there, there is a possibility and there is a, a risk that you might actually harm your patients. These are data from the ACCORD study and we can discuss this at length, I will not do that, but there, there appears to be in a lower, uh, a lower uh, benefit with intensive ter therapy in these patients than with, with standard therapy. So please be aware that you might actually treat your patients with a drug that can cause harm. So what can you do to retrieve data for you and for your clinic, for your colleagues, to uh, make sure that you're choosing the right treatment for the right patient? There's a number of uh, randomized clinical trials you can go to. Uh, more recently, proactive for pioglitazone and origin for Lantus. Uh, there is another way of looking at uh, the outcome of drug treatments for glycemia or for other conditions in diabetes. That is the epidemiology. That is what the EMA often uh, considers very important that you do phase three, sorry, phase four studies to make sure that the drugs that you, that you implement actually are also associated with the positive outcome. And then of course you will uh, be introduced in the, in the last lecture today to all the cardiovascular outcome trials which have been uh, proposed by the FDA to the drug companies to get the new anti-diabetic drugs on the market. So there are sort of three ways to gather information. Let's just go to the first way, the old-fashioned monotherapy randomized clinical trials. This is a very, very busy slide, I do apologize. This is the results of the proactive study showing that pioglitazone on top of usual treatment for diabetes was actually at least in the secondary outcome, which was predefined, so it's probably a valid analysis. Uh, probably uh, that pioglitazone in this study was associated with a better outcome, a lower risk of cardiovascular events than the placebo treatment. So you can go to the studies, see is, 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 is there a positive outcome? If there is, of course this might be a drug to consider for your patients. This is the results uh, table from the origin study, a large number of outcomes listed here. And if you, in the origin study, lower glucose after a uh, cardiovascular event by treating with Lantus, you would actually at achieve a, a, a neutral risk uh, for these patients. So in the origin, intensive treatment in a post-vascular event situation appeared to be neutral. No risk achieved there. And perhaps also no benefit. Uh, uh, whether, this, whether the origin uh, will amount to a benefit for the microvascular uh, events, we'll have to see. So randomized control trials are out there. You can study them and you can take some of the messages home to your diabetes clinic. And then you can go to the epidemiology. Uh, and see what happens in the real world, what happens in, 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 in your country when you have actually uh, used uh, the drugs for so and so many patients and, and what were their outcomes. And of course epidemiology is always uh, difficult to interpret because you cannot control for all the confounders. We, you, you were shown data uh, previously this uh, afternoon and, and they were controlled, they were corrected for smoking, systolic blood pressure and, and other factors. But there, all, there is also always a residual confounding in, epidemi in uh, epidemiology, so please be aware of this. Anyway, if we look uh, in, in Denmark at, at what happens to the risk for myocardial infarction, this is the adjusted uh, odds ratio for having a myocardial infarction with a number of different drugs, sulfonylureas, metformin, insulin, combination. These are drug naive patients. Uh, then you can see that there appears to be a lower risk than for the reference which was used or insulin with metformin. So 
This would suggest that, yeah, that in this epidemiolo sorry, <coughs> epidemiological setting in Denmark, metformin seems to be a beneficial drug for most, at least no sign of harm. Um, and this uh, is, you, you can study even more uh, in, in detail what happens then if you add to metformin the next drug. We have the uh, recommendations that you will have in most countries that metformin is a standard drug for type 2 treatment. And what should you add next? As you can see in Denmark, these are data of our own as well. Um, we add sulfonylurea. Uh, in spite of a discussion, we, we had it just uh, briefly previous, is, is our sulfonylurea actually harmful to the heart? We don't really know, or at least that was the answer we had. But still, we prescribe lots of sulfonylurea. We've known that for many years, they're cheap. Uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors as, as an addition to metformin is increasingly frequent. The uh, using insulin is increasingly free, frequent, and GLP-1 receptor agonists are uh, increasingly frequent as well. So this is what happens. You can study this in the epidemiology data of your country, and so you will know what, what, is, what, what are we actually doing to achieve the results that we, that we get. So um, what you can also do is to uh, see whether risk or fear of risk has any impact on your, uh, on your use of drugs. And this is a study that we published at the ADA just recently, uh, just asking ourselves, does the, the knowledge that the doctor has that this patient has, has had a cardiovascular event impact on the prescription of sulfonylurea, at least with us? We've had a long discussion. Are sulfonylurea is harmful when you have a cardiovascular disease? And uh, so we had this discussion for many years. And then we wanted to see, does it impact on the choice of drugs? And as you can see, there is no impact whatsoever. Whether you have a cardiovascular disease, or, 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 or no cardiovascular disease, the prescription pattern remains the same. Um, and uh, so these doctors did not take home at least the message that sulfonylureas might be harmful. Whether they are right that they are not harmful or whether they just didn't think about it, we don't really know. So lots of data to gain from epidemiology on top of uh, on top of uh, the randomized controlled trials. This is a, another epidemiological uh, study from colleagues in Denmark uh, discussing whether there could be actually a beneficial effect of some of the, uh, of some of the uh, uh, drugs that you might add to, uh, to um, metformin. And uh, this is the risk of all-cause mortality if you are on metformin and you have an added sulfonylurea, an added DPP-4 inhibitor, an added agonist of GLP-1 receptors, or insulin. And as you can see from the epidemiological data, it appears that there might be a smaller risk with the incretin-based therapies and a higher risk with insulin. Whether this is a true finding or a result of residual confounding, although lots of confounders were excluded in these analyses, we don't know. This is just for you to think about and to go and look up the information in the control trials that will ensue. So enough about epidemiology. No more studies from there. This is a very brief overview just of the DPP-4 inhibitor and the GLP-1 receptor agonist studies that will come to you uh, for, uh, during the next years. Uh, in the randomized cardiovascular outcome trials, and you will have a, a, a long discussion of that in just a moment. We've already seen the results from the Savotimi, from the examine study, from the TCOS. We've seen the results from the Elixir. And this Thursday, I believe, we will see the first results from the uh, SGLT2 receptor outcome trials. Um, so what should you do? You have a lot of information from the cardiovascular outcome trials. You have a lot of information uh, from the epidemiology. You have some information of well-performed uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. And uh, what, what, what's your conclusion? Uh, actually, it's very hard to tell you. Uh, it's, it, it is not so easy to, see, to tell you that this patient with these phenotypic characteristics should receive this drug, 
and then you're home safe, and you could go home and, and leave the patient to the general practitioner. It's not like that. But there are, of course, some obvious, uh, some obvious things. In your post-coronary uh, syndrome patients, you do not want uh, hypoglycemia, because hypoglycemia will, as you can see, glucose levels down here, QT prolongation up here, the lower the glucose, the longer the QT uh, interval. So you will not uh, want hypoglycemia in your patients who've suffered a um, uh, recent coronary syndrome because that will predispose to further complications. So some uh, things are quite obvious. So if you have a patient whom you consider to be at risk for a, uh, a hypoglycemic incident and unable to cope with it, do not use a drug that can, that can cause hypoglycemia. So that, that much we know. So, for the drugs that you have in your hands at the moment, uh, there seems to be no concern, no signal for cardiovascular harm for metformin. For sulfonylureas, you know there is a hypo risk. There is a long-standing discussion about glibenclamide, which in the States uh, is called gliburide, uh, that this might actually be harmful to the heart because of uh, ischemic preconditioning not uh, being performed very well. There seems to be no alarm signals for the GLP-1 analogs. The elixir trial is already out there, seems to be neutral. Uh, for the DPP-4 inhibitors, the examen uh, and the TCOS trial seem to be neutral. There was a signal for heart failure in the, in the several TIMI trial, and this uh, might be due to a chance finding, but in your diabetes clinic, it's certainly a flag that you, sh that you should be aware of uh, all the complications uh, post-coronary heart syndrome-wise. Uh, you will, of course, do what you can by lowering blood pressure, by lowering cholesterol, by lowering glucose to avoid another uh, attempt to avoid the atherosclerotic uh, process to uh, proceed. But actually, the immediate complications to the, um, to the uh, coronary syndrome, such as heart failure, will probably also be your matter in the diabetes clinic. So you will have to have some way of spotting the heart failure patients. Not always easy. You may need a cardiologist once in a while. But please be aware that the complications are probably also yours. Um, for the SG L2 inhibitors, we have no outcome studies yet, but we have uh, the EMPEREC coming out uh, Thursday. For ACABOS, there seems to be quite a positive signal, or at least no signal for harm. For the uh, TCDs, we have uh, a well-known risk of heart failure in, in, uh, by treating. This is not particular to patients with acute, acute uh, coronary syndrome. This is uh, a matter of uh, fluid retention. But the proactive study actually seemed to be quite uh, positive, at least for one of the secondary outcomes. So in my opinion, pioglitazone, if you do not have fluid retention, they appear to be quite safe. As for insulin, we know that there is a hypo risk. So please avoid the hypos in your post-ACS patients. They will not benefit from that, that is for sure. But the ORIGIN uh, trial with long-term lenses treatment in post-cardiovascular uh, event patients actually seem quite positive. So, from my perspective, and probably from yours, um, you can do a lot by, uh, by focusing on organization of your clinic. Uh, do something, it will probably benefit your patients. Uh, educate yourself, educate your nurses, your staff, whatever. Uh, buy new glucometers. We don't know what, what, what's, what's the right intervention, but the focus that you have by changing the organization actually seems to benefit your patients. Certainly, you will uh, focus on lipids, blood pressure, and thrombocyte uh, inhibition. Uh, certainly, you will have to uh, take care of heart failure and other conditions that might follow the patient with uh, a recent coronary uh, syndrome. Um, there are other complications, not only heart failure, atrial fibrillation might, uh, might follow uh, an, an acute <coughs> coronary syndrome, sorry. Be aware that some patients can actually achieve very tight glycemic uh, goals, 
uh, with your treatment and probably benefit by that, but also be aware that some patients might not uh, be able to achieve a glycemic level as you might want it. So make individual goals, make individual treatments, and focus on and one patient at a time in the choice of drug. And then actually make sure that you have uh, at least a telephone number of the cardiologist. Because even though he just wants to see the patient 2.2 days, once in a while it would be beneficial if he came back and did the echocardiograms or whatever, uh, just, just to check up on, on your patients and, and the complications. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that was it. Questions for Dr. Rugby? With insulin, I, I think uh, that what Dr. Rumpi has uh, emphasized is that if you look at the epidemiological data, every study shows that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in patients using insulin. Every study. The literature is actually literate with this evidence. But then, the first trial that was ever done with insulin, which is the origin, which is important to remember, was done in patients at high cardiovascular risk, not low, although they were recently diagnosed diabetics, and some of them were pre-diabetic uh, patients, uh, insulin was completely neutral. So I think this emphasizes the comment that you made about the fallacy of retrospective cross-sectional analysis versus randomized clinical trials, right? I certainly agree. You should probably be very careful with drawing conclusions, but, but certainly you should use the data to get ideas and actually just monitor what happens to your patients. Do we treat patients with uh, cardiovascular disease with fewer sulfonylureas than patients without cardio cardiovascular disease? And this is the sort of data that the epidemiology is, is very good at generating. So, and, and you should look at them, have the ideas, but be aware that if, if you need firm conclusions, you will, in most cases at least, need another trial, such as the origin, to confirm 